we are going to do today is to solve like more problems. And um, from now on, this is what we're gonna do for practice, all right? And I will do the same thing uh, also today for a problem solving session. So those of you who can make it will be a good thing to come. And um, we are going to start, uh, the more problems we solve in this particular case, the theory is not very difficult. Um, what we have to remember, there are a few things. And then in fact here, just I wanted to um, mention to you today that we are going to solve a few problems. Just one second. One moment, let me get something to I want to have something here to hold my iPad as I'm writing. And so we're going to solve some problems. But the one thing that you have to remember, before you try to solve anything in transmission lines, you will have to remember a few things. And then I'm not suggesting that you try to memorize them. But what you need to do, if you look at this here, and I will uh, put around it a frame so you can here oops not really that one here and here create a frame there did that work no all right so these these are the relationships that you need to put on a piece of paper have them somewhere um, put them on a document in your computer, whatever helps you. And you're going to have those in front of you before you solve any problem. So that is my suggestion. Um, because you will need those to be able to solve anything. And um, this is what we developed in fact, using the theory for transmission lines. First of all, from now on, the only thing we are going to do- It's three o'clock. From now on, the only thing we are going to do will be ideal transmission lines. When we talk about ideal transmission lines, primarily, we mean that we have a line like this one. It has um, a characteristic impedance, Z naught, which I will give you always, unless the line by itself gives you other data and then you find it. But Z naught is important. Um, every time I give you a transmission line, it's gonna have that. And then I will give you frequency or wavelength, if you remember. And there is a relationship between frequency and wavelength. And the relationship we are using between frequency and wavelength is this one, that lambda times F equals C. All right, that's what you're gonna get. And so um, most of the time, what you need is the wavelength. Why is that? Because of this relationship here. The beta, which is the propagation constant, is equal to two pi over lambda. And so what you're going to put on a piece of paper is what exactly I have here. First of all, will be V of Z that you have that at any point on the line, your voltage is the sum of two voltages. One is called incident and is the V naught plus E to the minus J beta Z. And it's called incident because this is what is generated by the source in the beginning. As soon as the source is connected to the line, it's generating this, the incident. But when the voltage after a little bit of time, because the line has a length, arrives at the end, whatever the end is, is gonna create a reflected, all right? And then over time, if you could, if you could imagine time and this, uh, this um, how, how can I say, if you remember, 
a, a, a game you were playing when you were kids. Most probably they use that at school when you tie a rope to the wall and you um, shake it and then you create a wave. Have you done that? And then that goes, you see the wave going down the rope. As soon as it reaches the wall, it comes back. Do you remember that game? And um, if the rope is long, then you see the wave going like this down and then coming back and then down and then coming back and then dissipates at some point. Now think that the rope is a real thing. So there is a, a loss associated with that, all right? Because this, the wave that you see on the rope is like a mechanical wave, all right? It's a pressure wave. You push the rope like this and then it moves. If you were on um, very close, if your rope was kind of short, you were very close to the wall, you create something, it reaches the wall immediately, all right? So the fact that it's short does not mean that you don't have this wave that comes back and forth, but it overlaps while it reflects because it's like when the front of the wave is like at the wall, the wave still has, you know, it covers like sometimes the wave covers the whole length of the rope. And then so another example is do that, um, um, when you have the rope that, the, that you jump, the rope, uh, you know, when you play, when you, you were kids, and then you have two kids, and then they hold the rope, and then they turn it around. Practically, they can turn it like this, <laughs> or they can turn it like this, all right? I mean, there are two different types. One is more difficult than the other, and you have to jump without hitting it, you know? You, I don't know whether you played that, but I was playing in the neighborhood in my age, so we were playing all of that. It's the same kind of thing you create when you hit the rope like this, two kids hit the rope, it's gonna go because it's short and the two kids are holding it, it's gonna go down or up, down or up, that's it. All right, so you have to enter in there when it's up. And then so you don't imitate, it's a game. The two kids, but the, the bottom line is this, if you can envision that. So you have in a, in a transmission like, it's like a long rope. Think of this like that. So you have an incident wave that I create when I shake it, and then the reflected wave that comes because that wave goes to the other end of the line, and the other end of the line is connected to something, and that is reflected, all right? So that's what you have. That is the voltage. Now, we found that for the current, we have a similar thing, but you have to pay attention that is 1 over Z0 in the current, and then we have a negative sign here. So that's important in the formula. Also, you remember that Z0 is gonna give, and sometimes if somebody gives you L and C per unit length, then you know the formula here, you can find it, all right? Now, what else you need to remember? Z input, at any position, this is our line. Remember now that if this line uh, has zero at the source, and the line has a length D, all right, then, and if we are at this point here, our distance from the source is Z, and we call our distance from the load Z prime, all right? So the distance from the source is Z, and the distance from the load is Z prime. If for some reason you don't remember, you get confused with what is Z and what is Z prime, you can write it as following. You can, in your notes, you can say the distance from the source, I will put it as Z sub S, as long as you don't confuse that with an impedance, all right, small Z. And my distance from the load is gonna be Z sub L, the only reason I'm not using Z sub S and Z sub L is because we use a capital Z for impedance. And I don't want, as I'm writing, to get confused. But for you, I need you need to remember in these formulas, what is Z that is your distance from the source? What is Z prime that is your distance from the load? Because this is important here. In the input impedance, you see Z there is a relationship, of course, between Z and Z prime. If you know one, then you know the other. Why is that? Because Z plus Z prime is D. 
z plus z prime is the length of the line, all right? So they're not two independent parameters. So if you go to any distance from the load and you're looking at the input impedance, z input impedance there, the input impedance is nothing else but the ratio of the voltage at that point divided by the current at that point, all right? That's impedance. Okay, and then what I want you to put down and remember is this formula. That always, if I am at any point on this line, then I can find the input impedance at any point. If I know the characteristic impedance as I do, if I know ZL, which is the load, and if I know my distance from the load, all right? So that formula gives it to you. Last time also we said the following. We said that we are gonna normalize the impedance so make things simpler. So I normalize here the impedance and what I have, the normalize the input is this simpler formula here, this one now. So I have simplified it a little bit, all right? And now we are introducing another parameter also important which is the reflection coefficient gamma always show the reflection coefficient gamma and a lot of times you're gonna see me showing the reflection coefficient like this all right in fact if i can make this a little more narrow so let me remove oops let me remove this um, you will see a lot of times to have the reflection coefficient here like that. That implies that at that point, um, at point C, C prime, where I am now, that it will be the reflection coefficient at C, D prime, all right? That's how we're going to indicate it on a line. This reflection coefficient at C, C prime, for example, is at Z, is nothing else but the ratio of the reflected over the incident wave. That's why you call it reflection coefficient, is the ratio of the reflected over the incident, which then it gives me this formula, which is important, all right? So is the reflection coefficient at that point, is the input impedance minus Z naught divided by the input impedance plus Z naught. And if I normalize, is my normalized input impedance minus one divided by normalized input impedance plus one. And that is also something very important to keep in mind. All right, so now. What was R again? Which one? Uh, the, just the thing we just solved for, the R of Z equation. I don't think I got what that was. R, you, you're talking R of Z or gamma? Uh, the, the, the equation on, on the bottom. This one, gamma. This one? Yes. Yes, that's the reflection coefficient. And it's gamma, the Greek gamma. Okay, and we call it the reflection coefficient. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of problems for you, examples. All right, so first of all is an open-end line, which was part of your um, tap hat. All right, open-end, first of all, before you solve any problem, the first thing is to put the formulas, and then the second thing, is to define your conditions at the ends of the line. First of all, you're, I'm going to give you everything about the line. I'm going to tell you, for example, that the characteristic impedance is 50 ohm, the length is going to be this much, and all of these. All right. In this case, we are keep it general, just to find some formulas. But when you have a problem to solve, I'll give you everything. So you, the line you're going to get, the characteristics. Then you have to write down, so you know all of these equations. Your equations are all here 
in that square. You can know them. So to solve a problem like an, an open end, you have to write the two conditions at the two ends of the line. There are two ends the line has. The end, the one end on the left is the source place. The other end on the right is the load. All right? So you have to write what we know. In this case, we know that the load is an open end. What does it mean when I have an open circuit? What, what is the impedance at an open circuit? So that's what you see here, which means if my load at the end of the line is infinite, the impedance at that point right at the end of the line is my load, obviously. That's what I see. So that's infinite. Okay. What happens when I have an open circuit? And from your circuits work, when you have an open circuit, do you know the voltage or the current? what happens to the open circuit. Which of the two has a definite value at an open circuit? Current. Yes, the current. The current goes to zero. Do you know how much your voltage is gonna be? No, because the voltage, the value of the voltage at that point is gonna be non-zero obviously, all right? But you don't know what it is unless you solve the circuit problem. You have to solve the problem to know the voltage at an open end but you know the current, you know it's zero. You know that, okay. So you put here that the current at the end of the line is gonna be I at D is equals D zero. From the source end, the source. What do we know on the source side? We know that the source is a voltage source and therefore it applies a voltage at that end of the line. Do you know how much this voltage is? How much of it? It's equal to the source. All right, do you see that? The, the source is fixed, it's connected to that point. The voltage at the source is gonna always be the voltage of the source, no matter what happens beyond it. You're not going to change the voltage of the source. You got it that, all right? It's like a it's like a, a hard condition. The load and the source give two hard conditions, which cannot change. All right. So the voltage at z equals zero is V naught, but I don't know how much the current is going to be until I solve the problem. All right. So put down the things you know from the source side and put down the things you know from the voltage side, from the load side. So that's what I've done there. Now, what I want you to do, number one here is to tell me how much is your current in at the source. I know the voltage, I know the voltage there is the voltage that the source applies to the transmission line. So it's V naught. But if I wanted to find the current, then how would I go about finding this current? If, for example, on think, think circuits now, all right? So always in a transmission line, your circuit concepts are not gonna be violated. So if you are at a circuit, I am giving you a circuit, and then I tell you between these two points, there is a voltage. Now tell me how much the current is. What do you have to find between these two points to tell me how much the current is gonna be? An impedance, okay? Usually we call it the Thevenin impedance. You remember that? Okay, you have to find that impedance. So here's the same thing. For me to find the current at z equals zero, I need to find how much is the impedance I see when I sit at the place of the source, looking inside the line, obviously, all right? So, how am I gonna find that? I'm gonna take the expression for the impedance, which is this one. Or this one, take either one, don't care. Either one is gonna give you the same result. And I'm gonna place there whatever I know. What do I know? I know, first of all, that ZL goes to infinity. 
when ZL goes to infinity, means it's gonna be larger than any other number, all right? Which means no matter what is the value of beta, of tangent beta Z prime, I know that always my ZL is gonna be larger than that. All right, you remember the infinity is larger than anything else. So I will ignore anything else that I have there the J tangent, I will ignore it because I know that always my ZL is gonna be bigger. So I ignore that. And then I, the same way I'm gonna ignore one because I know no matter what, one is gonna be much smaller than what I have next to it. So I'm gonna ignore one, I'm gonna ignore the, in the denominator, I'm gonna ignore J tangent in the numerator. And then what do I get? I get this ratio that has both in the numerator and denominator, this normalized ZL, which is infinite, but is both in the numerator and the denominator and I can eliminate it. Now I can do that because I have the expression in reality, you cannot divide infinite by infinite is not defined, it's like defining z dividing zero by zero, all right? You cannot do that. However, in this case, because it came out of a formula, I can, before I go and put place infinite for ZL, I will remove it. And then it gets out of the picture. And then what I find for my Z input is that is minus J, the minus J comes because I have a J in the denominator. You see that? I have a J in the denominator here. So when I, the inverse of a J is minus J, you remember that? Because J times J, just to remember, J times J gives minus one. So J is minus one over J, okay? So then, that gives me minus J and the inverse of tangent is a cotangent of beta D. And therefore, that's my input impedance. So what do I do next? I go, I divide uh, V naught by this impedance and that gives me the current at the source, which is here. J V naught tangent beta D. So that's how you find the current. All right. Any questions about that? I had a question um, yeah. on the top. How did the uh, one of the denominator and the J tan uh, go to zero? One, it did not go to zero. It's so small compared, maybe I should say that one. Let me correct the writing and say here for a second. So it does not, you don't get confused with that. I say it becomes much smaller and that's much smaller. So one, because the L is infinite, one then becomes much smaller. Um, you know what else you can do? But it's, um, you could divide everything in the numerator and denominator by this abel. If you do that, then you're gonna have if you were to divide, there are two ways of showing this. Let me show you another way too. Let me see where I am right now. I'm down here. So another way of showing that one can be neglected, can be eliminated, the same way like great tangent the numerator can be eliminated. I'll show you the following. Let me rewrite the Z input. I will rewrite it here, z input at z of z at z equals zero is equal to, div I divide numerator and denominator by zl normalized. So it's gonna give me one here plus j tangent of beta d divided by z. Let me put normalize a little further down, just a second. ZL normalized 
and then I will have 1 over ZL plus J tangent beta D. You agree with that? Can I do this? Yeah. Okay. How much is 1 over infinite? Is zero. 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 That is zero. And tangent beta d, whatever it is, is going to be much smaller than zl. So that is going to be zero because zl goes to infinity because z normalized zl is still infinite. Okay. So then from here, I have. That z input normalized at z equal d, excuse me, at z equal zero, which is at the source, ah, source, it is equal to one over j tangent beta d. Okay? which is equal to minus j cotangent beta d. Is that now clear a little better? Yes, and then so the ZL going to infinity, that was the uh, condition that we had for Open. the uh, Okay. I'm open Thank you. Okay. So now we got that. And from there we find the current from this because in the beginning the circuit you still have to divide the voltage which is at the source by the impedance and that gives you the current here. Okay. All right. So that's what we found another one. Now one more thing, and I will move the picture down so we have that in front of us. Copy. Okay, so here we go. Paste. The next thing now we want to do is, in fact, let me take this up, up, cut, and then put it here. Paste. Okay. So now the next thing is to find, find the reflection coefficient. The reflection coefficient at source, which is, that means it is equal zero. So I want to find the reflection coefficient there. Okay. So that's here what that means. I want to find that. All right. So now we go back to our formula. What do we know about our reflection coefficient? We know that at any point on the line, at any point of the line, the reflection coefficient, so we know here, we know, on the basis of what I gave you before in this square, remember this, this expression, the reflection coefficient at any point on the line is equal to the normalized input impedance there, minus one, divided by the normalized input impedance there plus one. Okay, so then we go here and first of all, from here, we find that Z, excuse me, gamma of Z, gamma when Z equals zero is going to be Z input at AA prime, and that's how I'm going to show it, minus 1 over Z 
input at a a prime plus one all right and we have found in fact let me i will erase some things here What we have found about z input at a a prime, z input at a a prime is here. That is z input. In fact, that is at a a prime. So because this is going to take me less space, that's what I'm going to do it from now on. It's minus j cotangent beta d. So I write here that gamma at a, a prime, you see how I'm writing it, at the source is equal to minus j cotangent beta d minus one, minus j cotangent beta d plus one. All right, which practically gives us one, plus j cotangent beta d and then one my own um, one minus one plus j cotangent beta d and that's what we have now let's observe a little bit that's kind of interesting to see the following let me look at that and then I will remind you something from complex numbers. In fact, I will add a page. Okay, then what I will do, I will remove all of this to the... Oh. Okay, it's here. I'm supposed to do it at the page. All right, so I will remove all of this to give us some more space down here. Okay, now this is a complex number. All right, so gamma, gamma, a, a prime is a complex number, complex number. That means it's going to have a magnitude and a phase. All right. Now, also, we have seen that gamma a a prime has something very interesting. It's like one number at top beta d complex and then it's a similar complex number at the bottom but there is only a difference of one sign in the real part okay now how would you find the magnitude of a complex number like that so to sub to see so the the question here is We'll consider a, a simple thing. So let's assume that gamma a a prime is the following. A plus, um, let me use different x. Well, let me use b plus jc and minus b plus jc. And now I want to find the magnitude of this. How would I do that? You should first take the uh, complex conjugate of the denominator, uh, and then also just just multiply it on both sides, and then yes, uh, yeah, that is that is true. What would I do if I did not want to find the phase but only the magnitude? Do you remember that when you have a complex number which is the ratio of two other complex numbers? All right, let's assume now that I have two complex numbers, A and uh, A prime. And then 
I have, so A is B plus J is C, all right? Do you agree with this that the magnitude of gamma A, A prime equals to the magnitude of A divided by the magnitude of A prime? Do you agree with that? Okay. Why is that true? It's true. But why is it true? Because any complex number can be written magnitude times a phase. All right. So gamma A A prime can have a magnitude times its phase. A can have its magnitude times the phase. B or A prime will have its magnitude times its phase, E, the exponential. The phase is the exponential, all right? But then all of the phases will contribute to the phase only. And all of the magnitudes will contribute to the magnitude only, all right? So you can just check it out, make sure that you understand what it is, why this is true that I put down, but that's the case, that if you have the ratio, like if you have also the product, if you have the product of two complex numbers, the magnitude of the product is equal to the product of the magnitudes. If you have the ratio of two complex numbers, the magnitude of the ratio, which is gamma in this case, is gonna be the ratio of the magnitudes. All right, so from complex numbers. So that's what you got there. So instead of me doing the multiplication which is correct it's correct to multiply with a complex conjugate of the denominator but I avoid these multiplications i say i'm interested only in the magnitude therefore the magnitude of this is going to be equal to the magnitude of this divided by the magnitude of this okay now, what do you observe there? Do you see something interesting? Uh, both uh, the numerator and denominator be the same. Exactly. The magnitude of these two complex numbers, B plus JC and minus B plus JC is the same. Why is that? Because the magnitude, just to remind you, you have to uh, uh, just um, memor rem remember those things. The magnitude of this is nothing else but the square root of b squared plus c squared. And the magnitude of this is nothing else but the square root of minus b squared plus c squared, which practically is the same like b with the above. So these two have the same magnitude. So what is interesting in this case, that always, you're gonna remember that, whenever you have an open end, the magnitude of your reflection coefficient is one. Extremely important. So this, so from here, the magnitude of that is one. That I want you to remember. So here, what do we conclude? We conclude, and then if I can put all of, all of this here together down a little smaller, and then remove this. So here is what we remember, conclusion. that the magnitude, so when line, transmission line, we, we show it like this, is terminated at an open end, then the magnitude of gamma everywhere on the line is one so 
since I have a line and there is a reflection coefficient at every point, but the magnitude is always one, what does it change for this reflection coefficient along the line? Obviously, you cannot have the same everywhere. All right, you remember the rope? Even if the, so the open end or the short end is like your wall. Let's assume that your wall was a perfect, all right, metal. Um, if you have the rope like this, it's like short, all right? It holds it there. Now, it's not gonna move, means short, goes there and goes to zero directly. If your, if say your wall, if your rope, I hold the rope here and that's my zero position. When it goes to the wall, it's gonna be forced. If they are the same length and the same height, it's gonna be forced to the zero position. That's a short. Think of that rope as like your wall and then the short there. Now, you know that there is a reflective way because you create something like that with it coming. All right. But also, you know, according to this, because a similar, a similar mathematics will apply to your rope. I, as a matter of fact, I want to tell you, if you wanted to write the math for an ideal rope will be the same. So according to that, my reflection coefficient is one. So what changes in the reflection coefficient? The phase. The phase changes, all right? The phase changes of the reflection coefficient. What does that really mean? Do you, we wanna understand what it means physically. It means that as I have two waves that come, think of the two waves, one is like this, like harmonic, all right? The other is also harmonic. It went into the wall and got reflected. So as they come and they overlap, in your case, in the rope, they're not going to be a continuous wave like we have here, but they're going to overlap. The waves are going to, you are going to see them like the sea waves. They're going to come like this, they will overlap. When they overlap, you will see that um, they, they change, the shape, the shape is changing and is changing differently when they overlap. It does not change, it does not seem like one thing. It does not seem like one harmonic. It does not seem like zero everywhere. It does not seem like, it seems like a wave. It's very interesting. It's like a wave that is not symmetric. And, and as they come together and they go over, it changes over during that time. It changes as they move, all right, in space. That tells you that there is, they, what, the, the phase of the reflection coefficient it implies that there's two harmonic waves which are like perfect signs. When they come, they overlap at different places on the sign, all right? So at the beginning of the signs will come here, then they will move like that, and then they will go away. And if you are at a different place on your harmonic function, you say that I changed my phase. That's how we understand that I am in the beginning of the harmonic, I am a quarter of a way, a quarter of a time away, you know, I'm in the middle of the harmonic, like half of the period, then I'm three quarters of the period away and so forth. That is called phase. That's how we understand where in the harmonic we are. When, when you say that, do you hear engineers say that the two of us are out of phase? <laughs> what does that mean? that we are out of phase. Practically, it means that I'm a 180 and you are at minus 180, all right? Or I'm zero and you are at 180 or something, practically. I mean, that we are totally, we have totally different, the same value different, we, we say that. We are out of phase in what we, and we say that all the time, all right? That means that we come together at different times of your harmonic function. And that is called phase, that's how we understand it. So what that means with the reflection coefficient is that yes, your, the magnitude of it is one, but the phase changes then, changes over time. So that's what you need to remember when you have a total open, like a, a, a perfect open, meaning an open, op, an, an open circuit or a short circuit at the end of the line. Well, the same thing applies for short circuits. So when you have open circuits and short circuits at the end of the line, 
then the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is always one. Which means there is total reflection of your wave, but the phase, the, the, how the, the wave does not lose anything at the end, it comes. I mean, if your wave is like this tall from bottom to the top, it's gonna, when they reflect it, it's gonna be the same, but it's gonna be at a different time of its progression that it's gonna come back to you. That's what it means, all right? So you have a phase difference of some sort. I mean, if you think it, even the way we speak about this in a common language. So that's what happens when you have a total open and a total short. What else also it implies? It implies that, as we will see later, and this is, um, it, it shows as a matter of fact, this is something else we'll discuss, but um, it implies that when you have an open or a short at the end of the line, none of your power gets dissipated there. It all gets reflected, all right? There is not the only reason, the only way for your wave to lose its power at the end of the line is if you have a resistive load. So if you don't have a resistive load at the end of the line, then all of it is going to be reflected, which means that that's why the magnet of the reflection coefficient is one. There is another thing here, and that is the most general case where you don't necessarily know what kind of load you have at the end of the line, but you take at some point the reflection coefficient and then you find this relationship is extremely important. If you know your reflection coefficient at the end of the line, and we call that gamma sub L, all right? And how much is your reflection coefficient at the end of the line? The reflection coefficient at the end of the line is going to be your load minus Z naught divided by the load impedance plus Z naught. That's what it is. If you know gamma L, then you know your gamma at any other point of the line. And your gamma at any other point of the line is going to be a function, obviously, of your distance from the load and is going to only alter the phase of your gamma L. And that's what you see here. That's an extremely important relationship too. Now, don't worry because it seems to be too much thrown at you, but we are going to see them over and over again, and we are going to get used to them. All right? That's why we need to solve problems there. So we found, therefore, the open-ended line, the shorted line, in both cases, the reflection coefficient magnitude is one. Remember that, OK? Now, another example is to find the same reflection coefficient when the end of the line has a resistor and the resistor is equal to Z naught, which is a characteristic impedance. Characteristic impedance is always real. Remember that? Always real. So now I put there a resistor, which is equal to the characteristic impedance of the line. Then I want to find gamma at any place on the line. But what do I do if I want to find the reflection coefficient at any place along the line? I go to the end of the line. I find the reflection coefficient at the end of the line. And then I just multiply it with an exponential. How much is my reflection coefficient at the end of the line? Is ZL minus Z naught divided by ZL plus Z naught. But ZL is Z naught. I told you that for ZL, I have a resistor, which is equal to Z naught, which means that my reflection coefficient at the end of the line is zero. What does that mean? That everything that goes to the end of the line is absorbed. That's what it means. It means that all of the wave that, I, that comes from the source towards the end of the line is going to be absorbed by the resistor. That is called a matched line. Matched because there is a matching between the load and the line. Always you have a matched line when the reflection coefficient is zero. 
okay? That's when you always get the match line. What happens now to the input impedance on a line like this? When you have a matched line and your ZL normalized is one, because it's ZL divided by Z naught, that's what the normalized ZL is ZL divided by Z naught. When that is one, then the numerator and denominator in your input impedance is identical, becomes the same, and therefore, this is the normalized, all right? Therefore, if you're not, not, your normalized impedance becomes one everywhere, which means that your input impedance everywhere on the line is equal to the characteristic impedance of the line. So what are you gonna remember? When I have an open or a short, then my reflection coefficient has a magnitude of one and my input impedance everywhere is a um, imaginary, is imaginary as we found it from here. Minus J cotangent, you remember? There. So when you have an open or a short, your reflection coefficient everywhere on the line has a magnitude of one and your input impedance anywhere on the line is imaginary. When your line is terminated at a resistor, which is equal to the characteristic impedance of the line, then the line is called matched because the reflection coefficient is zero everywhere. And the, imp the input impedance everywhere on your line is equal to the characteristic impedance of the line. All right? These are three very important three extremely important terminations, as we call them, of a line. And we're gonna see them in many different instances. So that's what we've done. And I will ask you to solve a top hat question, which is telling you the following. So you're gonna do this to solve. You're gonna start like with the end conditions you see here. It gives you a capacitor. Instead of a resistor at the end of the line, it tells you I have a capacitor at the end of the line. So your load is only imaginary. You remember an a capacitor as an impedance, what is it? One over J omega C, all right? So the impedance, the load impedance is gonna be minus J one over omega C. That's you keep in mind. And then you are gonna be able to solve the problem, but follow this. It's like an example. It's like a, a thing to practice a little bit, all right? That's what I want you to do. So I will give you this as a tap hat, and then we're gonna solve problems today. Like that, all kinds of different things. Also, I'll solve that for an inductance to see how I'm gonna do it today, all right? Any questions? So I just had a question on the so the reflection coefficient uh, just ref, so just indicating that the uh, like voltage value is like the voltage value compared to when it's going from mm -hmm. left to right on the transmission line to right to the left. Yes. So practically, when your your reflection coefficient is zero, it means there is no reflection. When your reflection coefficient has a magnitude of one, it means both your incident and reflected voltage waves have the same magnitude, but different phases. All right? That's what it means. Is that what you wanted to ask? Yeah, I think so. OK. Thank yes. you. Any other questions? I will um, record today's problem solving session and then I will put the solutions on because it's going to be a good practice to go over them. Okay. All right. So I will see you either today or on Friday. Thank you. All right.